got one to kick us off to the panel. Megan. How is regional government responsible for managing and improving marine ecosystems, and how are they dedicated to working with Tangata Whenua to do so? Who will be responsible for joined up reporting? That's the question. Okay, so there's several, several components to that. Um, have you got, is that somewhere? So there's who, who is responsible? Uh, well, we're not solely responsible, though obviously we have huge responsibilities in the 12 nautical mile. Um, limit, and so in the coastal marine area, we control the effects of some and not all land-based activities. So we don't control forestry, for instance. We can consent uh, the roads that are built to harvest forest, but not the, the felling of the trees. So there are some activities that we know are really harmful um, and generate, for instance, a lot of sediment, such as forestry does when the trees are harvested, but we can't control for those. But there are a whole range of other things we can control for, and, um, and we do variously well or not. Um, so what were the other parts of that question? There was many components to that. Oh, is it? All right. Um, Responsible for managing and improving marine ecosystems. We obviously carry out um, state of the environment monitoring, um, and then put that into management actions and writing objectives, policies, and rules in our regional plans that uh, are variously more stringent and make it more difficult um, or set the bar higher for certain activities and standards around those. In the recent um, freshwater limit setting uh, processes that we've been running around the region, in some of those cases where there are really sensitive marine environments at the bottom of those catchments, such as in Te Awarua or Porirua Harbour, we've also been... Um, we've been compelled by communities in mana whenua to set limits for things like sediment and metals, copper and zinc, in the estuary. And so the limits set in fresh water have been set to protect the values of the estuary. So even though that was a freshwater policy that says give, you know, give consideration to sensitive downstream environments, we actually went you know, as far as setting limits and objectives around restoration and then mitigations for the activities in the catchment. So we can do that as well, and we have done it. Um, and finally, uh, working with Tangata Whenua, so we um, are fortunate enough in this region, we have six iwi. Uh, we have really good relationships with them and a very well-resourced um, Māori uh, liaison unit, Te Hunga Whiri Whiri, um, full of people who are key liaisons into each of the six iwi. Uh, we've also... Um, been able to fund each of the six iwi so that they can resource people to be at the decision-making table with us in each of these whaitua or limit-setting processes. So we're really lucky in that respect. And finally, the question around responsible for joined-up reporting. Well, of course, that's, that's a big question. We all look to MFE periodically. Pierre, are you here? We um, look to MFE to lead some of that some of the time, but it, may, it depends on the scale. The joined up reporting depends on whether you're reporting back to your immediate community at a catchment level, the region, or nationally. But again, coming back to the monitoring and research, if it's done well, we should have a sort of a nested approach to our monitoring and reporting so that you can scale up or down accordingly and it'll be led by then whoever needs to know or make decisions at what scale. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Well, Kira, uh, my name is Geoffroy Lamarche. I'm the chief scientist to the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment. So Geoffroy Lamarche is French. I won't comment on your uh, rugby thing, but uh, we, work, we will welcome you in, uh, in September and we'll be there. <laughs> uh, but I can assure you we will keep the cap because I'm Kiwi as well, so I'm sure to keep it. <laughs> All black or, 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 or blue uh, doesn't matter for me. Uh, sorry, um, as um, I will raise my hand to ask a question, I suddenly, why did I raise my hand? I'm not quite sure how I want to raise my question, so uh, let me rumble a little bit. First, I want to go back a little bit on this amazing three days. I've, l I've learned quite a bit, and I've been at NIWA for 20 years before I moved to the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment, so I know a little bit about the, the seafloor. What, what I'm interested in is, is what we say about the lack of awareness of the, of the ocean. So, We've talked about the oceans often with a capital T and a capital O, 
And we all know here, we're preaching to the converted, but we all know that whether you go through the, the foreshore or the first, the sea break, it's, uh, and then you go to deep, we've also got the, the second deepest uh, sea, uh, the second deepest point in the ocean. So we go to 8,800 or whatever, it's like almost the equivalent of Mount Everest. Oh no, 10,000, I think it was. So it's vastly different from the flat, muddy, uh, um, sea floor we've got and the rough volcanoes so it's very diverse so how do we how the question i've got i'm trying to phrase it as I, as I speak how can we talk of impact on one sea floor when in some ways we could say there is 100 different sea floors i'm not quite sure i agree with what i'm actually saying but what what i'm saying the sea floor is so diverse how can you say we want what what's the how do you say how can you improve the impact we want a better ocean well, yeah, we all want that, but, but with something which is far more gutsy for, as you said, uh, Natalie, for the people to be aware of it and to care about it, if you tell them there is, ah, oh, we want a better ocean, the seafloor is quite diverse, they won't understand it. So how do you think, the, do we need several impacts for the deepest one, for the shallow, for the, but then we go back into uh, fragmenting, and then we, if we fragment our uh, impact, then we lose power, and so there's pros and cons in both ways. So um, how do you phrase, the questions to the, to the government, because at the end of the day, quite a bit of the money and the fund will come from government. I mean, we hope it will come from the private industry as well. And uh, sorry, I shouldn't point at you, all, you know, you're not the private industry anymore. <laughs> Oops. Um, but uh, yeah, so question how do you phrase the impact of the ocean? What is it for you? What does that mean? We need to improve the, uh, we have to have a better impact on the ocean rather than just have a better ocean. I can try and answer this first because I can also put on my hat of an estuarine activist, not activist, student. Um, so I'm currently working with, um, with cockles and tuangi and trying to restore uh, sand flats and trying to use endemic, these endemic taonga species to bring back some of the, the good stuff that's been lost um, because of degradation. So I feel like your question is super valuable um, because in general, I'd say it'd be amazing to have a focus on all these different parts of the seafloor. But I think what's most tangible, probably, to start off with is something that people can see. So the places that people can connect to, and that's usually the coast and the estuaries. So I feel like Drew's done a really good job in telling us how, how important it is to see that this is the, the interface um, between the land and the ocean, and it's getting hit by all different directions. So I feel like um, that's a really good start because it's very obvious. You can, you can, you can visually make out areas that are healthy. Um, you sometimes even get the, the tides to go in and out. It's exposed. You can walk out there. That's probably also why science has, is quite advanced in this, in this field because people have always gone out there with their bucket and spade. Um, so making it easy and accessible is probably super important because we, we don't need graphs for, for the people to understand what's going on. We just need to make sure that it's in their awareness that even if they don't think about the ocean or they're, they're not close to it in that moment, it, it does have an impact. And yes, the deep ocean will also be affected by our laundry, by everything that brushes off, by probably all the, the bits of wood that came down from the hills. Um, and it's good to, to go deeper. It's good to not stay shallow, in my opinion. And we need to do this. And we need to bring up problems. And we need to be yeah, um, putting them into context. But things that people can relate to, in my opinion, is, is the best start, because that makes them care. And I can add to this point, totally agree what Natalie has said. Um, I can add a little bit to this point with that business lens. So my experience as I've joined KPMG is that um, the, the businesses will first want to understand how do they interact with nature, or including our oceans. So that's going to be around the impacts and dependencies. So the easiest way to make oceans relatable to the private sector is to allow them to understand how do they actually depend on uh, different ecosystem services that the oceans provide. Um, and also, 
trying to kind of think if I actually want to do it. So there's this like terminology that I was, uh, I needed to actually learn a lot of new jargon. So if you thought that if, you know, our world didn't have enough jargon, then there's another <laughs> kind of world of jargon that, that is over there. So what businesses are talking about is this concept of materiality or double materiality, which is around um, what we understand actually by saying impacts and dependencies. So this is what really uh, the business community is interested in. So they will want to relate to things that are material to them existing in the business community. And I think that by us making that clearer to them to understand how much they depend on the ocean and what is the sort of, um, um, like, you know, how immediately that connection comes, whether it is, you know, for, for a, a, a fishery, like that, uh, connection is immediate, right? It's a no-brainer that they depend on the ocean. But maybe there are some businesses that in the second or the third order will have that ocean intersection. So um, for us, it will be really kind of cool to, to make that knowledge accessible to them, uh, to those yeah, businesses, to, to make that um, ability to relate uh, to the oceans. One last question. Uh, kia ora tato. Um, probably a little bit controversial. Um, that's me. Um, look, um, what we've seen in the last three days and, and what we know about developing the blue economy is going to take an awful lot of money for research purposes and it's going to have a lot of capital to try to maximise the value propositions that we might see and come from, from the maximising our blue economy. And um, what worries me is that if we leave that in the hands of a political framework that's subject to um, uh, political lobbying and advocacy from particular groups, I think it's um, a disaster waiting to happen. And um, I'd like views on really uh, um, the creation of a, uh, a proper oceans commission whose sole purpose is to speak on behalf of the ocean. That's not so controversial. Tony, I think um, several points really. I think we should start with an oceans minister, one that is responsible for the oceans only, no other jobs like revenue or police or whatever it may be, um, who acts as the facilitator um, between national organizations that build a blue economy um, on the basis of actually being trusted that are multi-stakeholder, that are not just business, but also include science, um, EV, and groups that are there to further value on a much larger scale. As our vision says, um, value for every New Zealander. Um, so I think that aspect is really important. And then that same Oceans Minister should also be responsible for faci facilitating interaction internationally to learn from other countries and with that also build knowledge internally then about what is happening elsewhere. I think coming back to the previous question, the awareness that is lacking should start very early. I find myself continuously in groups that are the converted, but there's a large um, share of the population out there who are not close to the ocean at all. Um, and I think we not, somehow need to find a way of building that knowledge in order to also build the pride. And I think from that point on, everything else will follow relatively automatically to build a situation where we um, build value from our ocean that goes across much more than just economic value. You still look skeptical. Tēnā koe, Tony. You go, Darcy. Kei te wai. Tēnā koe, Tony. Um, I think what we're talking about, value, value propositions and things of that nature, what it requires, and we've learned this over the last three days, is going to be just massive systemic change. Um, and if I'm to use that rugby analogy, which seems to be quite popular, let it be considered that Māori are the star player on that team, yet starved a position standing out on the wing. And you might consider, for example, perhaps that's as a result of greedy inside centres, ara ko te, ko te who won't pass the ball or take it into contact and get owned or, or fumble it and knock it on. Um, you, you've, got, you've got a really skilled winger out there who's brilliant under the high ball, ara ko Māori, excessive pace, ara ko te tikanga Māori, 
um, and just brilliant finishing ability. And so why not give possession to that player and that team? And so I think having a seat at the tepu, and as um, Maru rightfully said yesterday, Homai Te Poro, give us the ball, give us possession, let us dance, let us do our thing. I think that's a really important concept within that as well. For mass systemic change to happen and for those value propositions to perhaps switch and change, there needs to be a change at tepu and at governance level as well. Hey. Darcy, you sounded like you were describing me back in the day. Hey, kete tino tautoko o tera tera korero. You know, a couple of things for me. Kote au te moana he kote reo Maori. So that's that's all I'll say about that. And you go. Oh, but I don't speak Māori. I don't speak the real. Neither do I. But it doesn't make it wrong. So that's 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 what I hear. It's a real Māori. Uh, the second thing is, uh, following on from from Darcy's corridor, uh, we've got to be ready to take that ball, right? And the last thing we want to do is take that ball and kick it back. So you know, so that's a whittle to us. Man, we we. And I believe, I'm like you, I believe we're ready. Uh, we've done our training. Uh, we've been dieting. Uh, <laughs> you know, and it's time. I, I absolutely believe it's time that we, we're given a go. Kia ora. Let's have a big round of applause for our panel. <laughs>